Fueled by a traditional flurry of Peter Molyneux enthusiasm, Fable debuted in 2004 to widespread acclaim. An RPG that plays with Western fantasy cliches, it casts you as a hero or villain, depending on your actions, who roams the roads of Albion in search of quests and glory. Though that first game didn't deliver everything promised, which became a theme through the series, critics and players alike were charmed by its good humour, involving combat and open gameplay. It gained legions of fans who all wanted desperately to believe Molyneux, Fable's figurehead, and his spiralling assertions about mechanics to come in sequels. When Fable 2 did release, most critics were satisfied with its admirable expansions on the world, not least the addition of a dog. It was larger, more ambitious, and even introduced a two-player co-op mode. Yet, grumbles grew louder in the community about its perceived steps backward, which only intensified with Fable 3. Despite the new ability to rule as Monarch driving the narrative, the third title came with significant backlash for a variety of missing features, short length and easy difficulty. However, across all three games, music, and sound in general, has remained essentially free from criticism. Famously, the series got a huge boost from its main theme by Danny Elfman, much respected composer of The Simpsons theme, many of Tim Burton's best films, and a continuing list of impressively diverse credits. But the real mastermind of Fable's audio was Russell Shaw, a veteran in the gaming industry who had earned his stripes through years at Bullfrog Productions, Peter Molyneux's previous company. Until then, Russell's music was written mostly for sound chips with synthesized instrumentation. For Fable, fully scored orchestras and delicate choirs were the order of the day, leading an already respected composer into new territory. Even with fresh challenges in its production, his work on the series is one of the key pillars of its success. It fills Albion with character and life, arguably evolving more over three releases than the gameplay itself. I'm Lee Tyrrell, and this is The Sound Test, where I look in-depth into video game audio and music, along with the very people who crafted it. As part of an expansive interview with Russell Shaw, I got the chance to ask several questions about Fable, a series I place close to my heart. Through this episode, you'll hear his insight on all three main Fables, and the unreleased Fable Legends, which had an entire soundtrack completed before it was cancelled. This is the first episode of a Lionhead Studios double bill, and you can also check out its second part about their debut game, Black and White, on whatever platform you're listening on. As important as Russell's music is to Fable, the initial spark came from outside the world of VGM. Danny Elfman, who had never worked in the games industry before, was the first to compose for the series, not long after a multi-award nominated score for Big Fish. Since he only wrote the main theme, how did he get involved with the project, and why was the decision made to bring on Russell for the remaining OST?
the story behind Fable is, is quite quite a uh, an evolved one in the, in that the guy who, who at that time who owned Microsoft lived I, I believe that he lived next door virtually to Danny Elfman and um, knew him and we got to the point where there were intimations that Danny Elfman wanted to do music for a computer game and so I think Fable came up and so we had the call with him and he said yeah I'd love to be involved with it um, so of course we were thinking superb he's going to do the whole game um, and you know I'll sit back on this one and just let him let him do the whole game uh, but it very quickly became obvious that what he really wanted to do was to just write the theme track and nothing else um, and then hand it over and that would be job done for him so so consequently it was going to be down to me to compose the rest of the game but in a style similar to what Belfman had given us in the theme track um, uh, which of course was a massive baptism of fire for me because I, A, I'd never worked with orchestra before and B, I was, you know, following in the footsteps of one of the biggest Hollywood composers that there was around at the time. So it was sort of doubly worrying for me to, to be able to actually um, approach the game from an orchestral point of view. The eventual theme that Danny Elfman contributed is jam-packed with great melodies, perfectly laying out Albion's atmosphere through epic strings, bombastic brass and intense percussion. The general sound and instrumentation obviously sets the tone for the rest of the score, but many of its individual phrases show up directly too. Russell was on board even as the main theme was composed, helping to guide its final form and listening out for elements he could adapt. What happened was he he, he sent us three tracks basically, uh, and we and he asked us to choose one of the tracks as the one that he would then go on and record that to the orchestra. But what happened was we realised that there were elements in all three that we quite liked, so. I, I then went through each of the tracks and said, I want, you know, can you possibly do the first minute from this track, you know, um, uh, 60 seconds to 68 seconds from this track, blah, blah, until we had a complete three minute track. Um, and he agreed to that in the end um, and uh, went away and recorded it with the orchestra, uh, recorded the track and then sent me the recorded track and the MIDI file that went with it and the score. And, um, and, and it wasn't until I actually got the track back that I sort of had to think about how I wanted to approach the rest of the game. We've paid for, to have Hollywood composer Danny Elfman on our, in our game we really should use the theme throughout the whole game if we can. So I, I then started to go through the track, picking out motifs, like you say, and different uh, melodies from the whole intro track to use throughout the game. Russell's soundtracks for several Bullfrog games in the 90s proved his skill for writing chip, synth, and occasionally guitar music. Orchestras are, of course, a completely different beast. They're intensely difficult to master, and it says a lot that many still miscredit Fable's whole OST to Danny Elfman who had far greater experience with such arrangements. With a little help from Alan Wilson, Russell stepped up more than admirably, discovering a natural affinity for orchestral composition along the way. I thought, well, I'll give it a go. I, I, will, I will definitely see what happens and uh, got in contact with, a, with an orchestrator uh, who had worked with Danny before, 
called Alan Wilson, he uh, he made me instantly feel at ease and just said, "You just write whatever you want, and we'll make it. You know, we'll make it sound good at the end of the day." Um, so I started to compose, basically not knowing anything about big orchestra. I'd worked with, with you know small orchestras before and orchestration, working with strings on on parts and things, but never an, a massive ninety-piece full orchestra. Um, and it's just one of those things that luckily I really, really took to. I just found that I could do it. I would compose in MIDI format with samples in my studio. Um, I then printed out a score directly from, from Cubase and sent that over to Alan, the orchestrator. And he then made it orchestra friendly by, you know, assigning all the right parts to all the instrumentalists, um, working out uh, who should come in where and when in, in the score, what the Divisi parts were, etc. cetera. And, um, and then when it was all finished, we went off and recorded it uh, with the Philharmonia and it's, the rest is history. <laughs> Straight away, as if orchestration was nothing new to him, Russell leaned into the advantages that come with it. Different sections, like woodwind or strings, all offer their own textures and approaches, which create a wide range of feelings when mixed together in the right ways. As Russell's first fully orchestral soundtrack, he'd be forgiven if it wasn't quite as dynamic as it could be. But in the end, different playing styles and instrument groups give separate locations their own distinct flavours. For example, Fable's largest settlement, Bowerstone, has a bustling, lively spring in its step from the use of plucked strings, a technique known as pizzicato. That was always a conscious decision, was that I wanted a region uh, to, to have its own identity. With the pizzicato one, I'd been listening to a lot, a lot of um, Ravel's string quartet. There's, there's a piece in that which is pure pizzicato, and I thought I really want to write a, a full pizzicato piece for this, for the village. Um, a because it won't be overpowering, and B it's just something that sounds quite nice as you're running around the town. I sort of took uh, sections of, of uh, like Oakvale and. Um, uh, what, what other areas of the game and I thought I'll, I'll convert it into pizzicato and see how it sounds and it sounded really good. I sent it off to Alan the orchestrator and he said it's in the wrong key Really, yeah. So it really, you need to. This all needs to be in G rather than whatever key I've written it in. I don't know because you would get the best, best tone out of violins if it's in, if it's in G. We did that, and it sounded. Yeah, the difference was incredible. When, when, you know, once we realised that this is what an orchestrator does. You know, he basically tells you how things are going to sound best, and the, and the Bowstone piece as uh, came out, came out great in the end. Beyond the orchestra itself, composing for Fable led Russell down yet another new path. The whole series makes heavy use of the Pinewood singers, who can also be heard on soundtracks to certain Harry Potter and Medal of Honor games.
They're a key part of Fable's sound over the years, appearing in many central themes, and even sitting front and centre for some of them, like the Guild. Considering that tackling an orchestra for the first time is no easy task, why did Russell choose to include a dedicated chorus too? Well, first of all, there's Elfman, because he's very big on choir. Um, you, you know, at that time, sort of Edward Scissorhands was, was one of our, or everyone's favourite soundtrack and the choir in that was was something that i really really wanted to get a similar feel in in um in the fable series and so consequently when alan's uh, you know again the orchestrator said i've got a great team the pinewood singers they're all top-notch choir people and they'll just give you a really great sound i then started to think how else can i use them I used them for the guild in Fable 1, so I had the ladies singing during the day and the men singing sort of in a Gregorian chant style at night. Um, I had uh, I had them do like a, a, lig- a ligety type, type style track, a bit like, I don't know if you know, 2001, the Space, um, space Odyssey. Um, it's all ways of experimentation with, with the orchestra and how you can use them you know, differently throughout. And once I'd used them for Fable 1, I thought, oh, I, I just love this so much, I'm just going to use it, you know, throughout the series. And they're such great singers that everything they do just sounds fantastic as soon as you put it in the game, really. The Pinewood Singers along with the orchestra itself, make fables sound remarkably organic. But subtle synths make their way into the overall palette too. You can hear them most prominently in-game in the Temple of Arvo, but they also help form several soundscapes and moods throughout the series. Synths are, of course, much more in line with Russell's work for Bullfrog titles in the 90s, and came more naturally to him. Conversely, mastering orchestral scores is no small challenge, so what influenced Russell to make use of restrained electronics as well? couple of things really. First one is it may have been that we'd already recorded the orchestra and and decided we, we needed a new track, you know, so that, that something that that wasn't necessarily or, necessarily orchestral, but just needed to be like a background ambience, so, you know, what you're actually playing. So I so I started to do, you know, work with synths for that. There was also occasions when it just needed to be a synth. There was just no, it, like, uh, there's a whole dream sequence in one of the fables where um, the hero goes back to his childhood with his sister and he's sort of living in a in a dream cottage and, and none of it is real. Um, and it, the, the whole sequence just really needed to be a synth. There was just no way an orchestra was going to work behind it. And it was lovely to do that because, you know, working with the orchestra from, from nine to five, every day it, it, sometimes it's just great to have a, a synth break <laughs> and just write something that that is ambient and and synthetic and i really love it the melodies and themes of russell's music for fable have the power to transport you directly back to Albion, the game's fantastical setting. In reality, Albion is an outdated term for Britain, and its use in the series was well considered. The English countryside 
and celebrated British fantasy novels like Lord of the Rings were obvious references for the development team as they built the world. Those influences shine through in one of the game's best received features, voice acting. You won't be disappointed here. Practically every NPC accent can be traced to somewhere in England, Scotland, Ireland or Wales, often exaggerated for comic effect. Does it take a lot of training to look that stupid? You what? Dynamic and genuinely funny, Fable's inhabitants grow even more distinctive across the series, drafting iconic UK talent like Stephen Fry, my dear friends, John Cleese. Ah, yes, one's heart soars before such regal bearing. Simon Peck. Count me in. Ben Kingsley. We don't take much stock in words around these parts. We're simple folk. Russell left this task to other professionals for sequels, but recorded and directed sessions for the original, which remains memorable to anyone who played it. We had great fun doing that, because I think Fable was pretty, pretty groundbreaking in terms of how how we recorded NPC dialogue. So when you have, you know, just people standing around muttering things in the background, and as you run past, you can hear them say something based on on on, on your character and your reputation and stuff like that. It's pretty groundbreaking in those days. I don't know many games that have done that before. And of course, we were able to to almost give it a Monty Python esque feel as well with with. Um, with the way that we recorded the dialogue, you know, it was, it wasn't sort of, um, we didn't have to rely on sort of straight lace talking people and and uh, and the sort of narrative you get in a spy game or, or a military game. We could really go to town on on dialects and and uh, accents and different regions of the UK, and uh, we had really really great fun doing that. God, your face looks like a smacked arse. That's a role in itself. That just just directing voice actors and and putting them in there, yeah, actually implementing them into the game takes forever. Taking on all the audio for a release was par for the course when composers worked with sound chips. But Fable is a prime example of the increasing size of games at the time, and how that affected the teams behind them. Following years of crafting the music and sound effects for multiple titles in his career, doing the same for Fable made sense. It wasn't obvious how demanding that would be until work had already started. After all, each of Russell's roles on the first game could be comfortably filled by specialists, which is exactly what happened for follow-ups. Fable 1, the original Fable, was the very, very last time that I realised I could, I, I was able to to do all the sound, all the music and everything in the game. That was the last time I ever did it because it was such an enormous game. It nearly bust me, that game, because it, it had like, I don't know, 20,000 lines of dialogue in it. Um, j uh, just, just um, you know, a couple of thousand sound effects and a big orchestral score uh, and I did the whole thing myself um, and it was really really it, it almost did me in because it was such a you know working till very very late at night uh, just the, the panic of getting the game finished for a start um, and like I say it was it was the last time I had overall control over every everything how it sounded in the game because from then on we had to you know contract people in to help with the sound effects um, we had a whole team over in, in Redmond at Microsoft who uh, were at our disposal as well for doing sound design and uh, another another department took care of recording all the dialogue and yeah so consequently Fable 1 was the last time I was ever able to do that.
For Fable 2, sound design duties were handled by Microsoft Game Studios, while Side UK took on voice production. A company whose work can be heard in titles like Zelda Breath of the Wild, God of War and Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Separating the jobs allowed room for a dedicated dialogue team to invite a string of cameos into the studio, while Russell could concentrate his energy on the music alone. This time, he came to the project with a much greater confidence in using orchestral textures, and eagerly took the chance to expand on his earlier compositions. So moving on to Fable 2, I was being much more experimental with the orchestra in, 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 with how I was composing. It was, it was more of a, it wasn't so standard. I mean, for, the, for Fable 1, I was doing what you, what you might call basic orchestration. Um, wasn't experimenting with how the instruments sounded or all the different effects that they can do. And with Fable 2, I started to experiment with that, with, um, with different sections of the orchestra playing different things and, and doing effects on their instruments. Yeah, it worked out really well. And you're also sort of learning more and more about what an orchestra can do and what they can't do uh, and what each instrument can do, which is, which is something that the orchestrator knows instantly, but they sort of teach you as you're going along. You know, they'll say, I mean, you can't give that part to a bassoon, it will sound too squeaky, or you can't give that part to the violins, they're, they're, there's not, not enough of them, you know, and you start, you start to learn the limitations of the orchestra and work within those boundaries. Once you've got one orchestral soundtrack under your belt, for, you know, so to speak, you, the next one is always a million times easier because you know the score, you know the tricks of the trade, you know what you can and can't say in a studio in, while you're recording it. Um, you know, all the uncertainty that you had making the first one is has largely gone. It's all just down to composition then and coming up with the right, with the right musical ideas. Pretty much everything about Fable 2 is bigger and more ambitious than its predecessor, but there are some exceptions that left certain fans feeling cold. The majority of players had a great time with the game, and it fared even better with many critics, but Voices of Descent definitely grew louder. Citing missing and underdeveloped features as the source of their ire, fans felt a trend was quickly growing for broken promises. Such debates are best left to Reddit and forums, but even the most vitriolic thread leaves music out of the melee. Instead, players noticed and appreciated Russell's more experienced flourishes and clever repurposing of much-loved tunes from Fable 1. You never want people to say, oh, it sounds just like the last one, or, or oh my goodness, you know, I'm not being very experimental, you know, it's, it's just basically that uh, the same old, same old that he's coming out with. So you instantly want to improve on what you did, what you did before, and make people impressed even more than than how they were the first time. Um, but the second thing is, I'm also I've also always been acutely aware that people love continuity 
from a motif point of view so so that they recognize different bits and pieces from what originally went before in the same game so it could be a harmony line it could be a vocal line the fact that i use the music box throughout each of the three three games in the series just little hooks and things that people recognize from before without being overly obvious it's one of the one of the things that everybody picks up on is the fact that that the fable motifs run throughout the whole game and uh, people seem to really love that. Within Fable 2's setting, the land of Albion has moved on by 500 years, developing primitive firearms and big cities in the process. The main settlement from the first game, Bowerstone, is ever present through the series acting as Albion's capital in sequels. Despite being fleshed out to include a number of districts, and taking on a dynamic nature depending on your actions, its music references Bowerstone of old without repeating its theme. Instead, the same feeling is achieved simply through instrumentation, which once again puts pizzicato strings at the forefront. Brand new melody. In fact, it's the melody from the intro. So I, I, gen, I generally tended to use the themes that I used in the intro of the game throughout the rest of the game, if I possibly could. But also, I sort of I wanted to make it a little bit more up to date. So I put woodwind in there and um, some other instruments alongside it and um, as you say it's exactly the same sort of feel because it's meant to be the same the same type of place and um, but a different time period you know and a different a different slightly different feel As well as plucked strings, both those Bowerstone tracks use a time signature of 3-4, which plays three beats per bar instead of the more common four. Three-four is still found regularly in popular music though, evoking the ballroom waltzes that traditionally made use of its staggered bounce. In the Fable series, Bowerstone is far from the only place to use such a timing. In fact, triple meters form the rhythmic basis of almost every major theme, profoundly, but quietly, influencing the character of the whole series. Three four is my favourite style to compose. Uh, it just lends itself to being lyrical and melodic and lilting. I just find it really, really, uh, just a, a really nice uh, time sick to work to. That and six eight. So uh, you know, basically anything which which is just not as like you say a straight four on the floor just feels more melodic to me. There's been so many times when I've started off writing for Fable in the 4-4 and just thought, this just isn't working, and just swapped it to 3-4 and it's instantly worked. And, um, and that's why, really, I just really like, like writing in, the, in, in, that, in that time signature. Common elements like timing, individual melodies, and instrumentation, all fed through to Fable 3, aired clearly in its main theme. But Russell had no interest in stopping his growth as a composer once he'd gotten the ball rolling, always seeing the series as a chance to evolve. Therefore, its third iteration came with the most diverse and inventive OST of the lot. A live orchestra, 
and the Pinewood Singers still define most of its sound, but they're often experimented with and twisted in new directions. By the time we got to Fable 3, I'd already done two previous games uh, and knowing that I, I really started to need to be a little bit more left field with it all and, and, and not stick to the rigid formula I had done with the previous two. And so yeah, like you say, I started to be a little bit more experimental. The storyline itself lent, lent itself to that because it was much more script driven and it was and it was, had areas in it which which were not like the first two games which allowed me to do sort of arabian style music it allowed me to do uh, horror style music the tracks that spring to mind are the ones where you're given a horror scenario and i had to make people as scared as possible There are a multitude of areas and sections in Fable 3 that allowed Russell more room to experiment than before, whether it's the Middle Eastern melodies of the desert or the numerous minimal and experimental offerings that run through the score. Potentially the most unique track on the game's OST, and easily the longest at 11 minutes, is Reva Mansion. Used in a side quest focusing on Stephen Fry's character, Reaver himself, the piece is actually several compositions in one, and not all of them by Russell. In fact, the classical guitar that anchors its first half is a collaborative effort, featuring contributions from Ferdinando Carulli and Costas Serifis, who also performed some of it. In an unusual choice for the series, which uses exclusively original music otherwise, the rest of Reva Mansion consists of Bach, played on a duet of piano and harpsichord. Reva was always going to be playing classical music in his, in his, in his castle. It was, just, it was just something that I knew very early on I was going to do. I wasn't sure yet whether it would all be guitar, whether it would be, you know, you know, piano or whatever. I just knew that I was going to be playing classical pieces uh, over the top. And one day, in my in my office, a guy who was one of the one of the coders there, Costas, he came in. And he said, "Can I play you something on on my classical guitar that I that I've composed?" And I said, "Yeah, go for it." whole piece based on a based on uh, the one of the earlier fables um, the whole theme played on on classical guitar and um, I said ah oh, it was so good I said I've got to, I've got to record that put it in the game which I did um, and then from there I, I it sort of lent itself to the style then I knew that I wanted it to be mainly classical guitar so I I recorded a couple more pieces uh, there's there's pieces. I think there's a piece there by Fernando Saw. Um, I can't remember the other one. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that was me playing those. And then then I thought, well, we'll give it a bit of variation. I'll record some some Bach as well. So uh, one of the guys at Lionhead, Mark Adami, he was he's just a genius piano player. Um, he came in and recorded 
two uh, Bach pieces for me. One from the Well Tempered Clavier, I think, and one from the. I think. Uh, what, what, I can't remember what the second one was from, but um, yeah, they're basically clavier parts, but he, but he played them on the piano just amazingly. Um, and the whole soundtrack, the whole sort of soundscape to, to Reba's mansion sort of went really nicely after that. Once again, Russell's hard work was appreciated when Fable 3 released, but the game itself was less well received. It's unfortunate that some players forget the strength of its audio, in favour of frenzied complaining about missing features on social media. For the main trilogy's finale, the music took another step forward as its composer continued to challenge himself with orchestral sounds. Yet, in the end, more unfulfilled promises about the gameplay itself led to a largely disappointed fanbase, who loudly contradicted its positive critical reception on every forum available. Rightly so. Russell's music is usually left out of the fray entirely, with many recognising its growth and ambition. From there, the main series shut up shop, leaving rumours about a fully-fledged Fable 4 still flying around. Next, fans were given a chance to see Albion from a different perspective, through a string of spin-offs of different sizes. First came Fable Heroes, a hack and slash twist on the world with a bespoke soundtrack by the legendary Robin Beanland, probably best known for Sea of Thieves, Conker's Bad Fur Day, and several other rare classics. Russell returned himself for the journey, which used Xbox Connect to give players hands-on access to their hero, Gabriel. The Journey is another example where the game's reception tends to distract from the music, but at least people can pick it up and decide for themselves. With Fable Legends, the series' final standalone title, only a small handful of players have any idea how music sounded with the action. Cancelled before seeing a full release, Fable Legends only really exists now through its two official soundtrack albums by Russell. It's fantastic we can hear them at all, and the tracks within show how far their composer had come. They're the culmination of all the evolution and growth that had come before, so how does it feel to put that much effort into an unreleased project? Fable Legends really was, a, was the culmination of 10 years of learning how to use an orchestra properly, really. Of learning how to get, bring power to the orchestra, how to write really good combat music and scripted music. It all came together so beautifully on Fable Legends that uh, it sort of added to the disappointment of it all really when it didn't actually come out. It was gutting, absolutely gutting. I've never worked so hard as on, as on Fable Legends. It was, um, you know, morning, noon and night, well into the early hours, composing, 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 sort of four hours of music, massive orchestral scores. We did it in over a number of sessions to get it all finished. And when it was finished, I thought, wow, that's probably the best work I've ever done. I really did feel that at the time. I just felt like I'd 
outdone myself, which was, I, I was so, so exhausted at the end of it. And to come out with something that I was quite pleased with was, was amazing. And then, of course, we all heard that, um, that it, was, it was never going to be released on a game. And uh, yeah, hugely disappointing, but, uh, but life goes on. I think I tweeted about at the time, you know, I feel really strange today in that I have a soundtrack released for a, for a, a game that doesn't even exist. <laughs> Following its tumultuous development, Fable Legends was the last nail in the coffin for Lionhead Studios. Its concentration on free-to-play online multiplayer proved to be too much of a risk, especially since many involved were new to working on such a game. Peter Molyneux moved on to 22 Cans, where he continued in the same vein he's known for today. Other principal members of the team founded Two Point Studios, whose Two Point Hospital acts as a spiritual successor to Theme Hospital, a Bullfrog Productions classic. For now, the future of Fable lies in Microsoft's hands and hasn't come without teases. Though 2019's E3 came with widespread rumours of a new game announcement, fans were left cold for another year. It can't be said for sure how likely another release will be, but it says something that players still think of Albion and its colourful characters. In spite of a waning reception, Fable is still held dear to a great many people, and Russell's melodies are still synonymous with the memories we formed with our heroes. It's one of those um, uh, sort of an eye-opening time when you think, God, I can actually do this. And, uh, and it was all sounding, it was sounding really good. I just thought, I'm really enjoying doing this. Everybody else in the company thought it was sounding great as well. And so I, you know, sort of ploughed ahead with it and, and came out with some, some really, really, uh, some tra tracks that I'm really, really proud of. Thanks to Russell for speaking to me for the sound test, but thank you too for taking the time to listen. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please make sure to follow or subscribe on whatever platform you might be listening on. This second series of VGM podcasts is set to be far bigger than the last, featuring several console deep dives, explorations of individual games and series, and genre-specific specials. There will be a new episode each week, with next week's launching into the nearly infinite universe of No Man's Sky. Along with veteran sound designer Paul Weir, I'll be joined by 65 Days of Static founding member Paul Walinski. Together, we'll be taking a look at the challenges that come with procedural music and how they achieved a constantly dynamic blanket of sound. All my Patreon supporters gain early access to that edition, no matter how much they pledge. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash underscore secret cave if you'd like to show your support and hear next week's episode right now. Of course, this doesn't apply if you're already a patron and hearing this episode in advance. That's impressive.